Welcome back everyone and thank you for joining us for our second session today in teaching the 57th U.S. Presidential Inauguration Q&A with Smith Smithsonian experts. And we're joined by Brianna White from the National Portrait Gallery who's going to speak to us about looking at America's presidents. Brianna, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so the Portrait Gallery is of course one of the Smithsonian Museums here in Washington, D.C. And we have a very specific mission. Our mission is to tell the story of America through the people who've shaped it. And one particular exhibition that we have certainly does that, um, and it is called America's Presidents. Um, the Portrait Gallery holds the only complete collection of portraits of the presidents outside of the White House. The difference, of course, being that our portraits are of the president either before they were in office, after they were in office, or during their time in office. So during this session, for the next 50 minutes, we're going to be looking at the portrayal of the president, um, both in what the portrait can tell us about the individual, but as well as how that portrayal has changed over time. So we'll look at George Washington, we'll look at Abraham Lincoln, um, John F. Kennedy and our current president, Barack Obama. So pay special attention to how that portrayal has changed from Washington to Obama. And we'll sort of end our time together with the discussion of that change. But before we begin, um, I wanted to just say out to the group, um, just thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to say out to the group, what does it mean to read portraiture? Um, so if you can respond in chat, that would be great. You'll also see that there's a poll up there. Um, do you use portraiture in the classroom? Yes or no? Um, and I see that we're sort of 57, 50, 50, 55, 45. So it okay. looks like about a split. About half and half. And that's typically what I find um, when I speak with students and teachers. Um, and so my hope coming out of this session is that the students will love looking at portraits and the teachers will be comfortable reading portraiture with their students. Um, so what does it mean to read portraiture? The question I pose to all of you. And as you're thinking about this, consider what a portrait is. Um, at the Portrait Gallery, like I said, we, we collect portraits of individuals who have shaped our history. So a portrait to us is always a likeness of an individual. Um, you know, and it has the person's face, it might have other things, we'll get to that in just a second. But Yes, exactly. So Jill um, from Florida says we look for the symbolism um, in portraits. Um, that is absolutely right. And this idea of symbolism is key when, um, when looking at portraits. And we'll get into that when we take a look at our first piece. Um, and Mina in North Carolina says that um, we look at portraits to glean historical information also accurate um, because at the portrait gallery we consider ourselves to be a history biography and art museum so we are looking at all of those bits in order to tell the story of the portrait so that is all excellent thank you um, so before we move on we know now why we read portraiture but i guess the question is how do we do it um, and so at the Portrait Gallery, we have come up with a number of visual elements that we use in order to learn about the person in the portrait. And we call those elements the elements of portrayal. And so on this next slide, you'll see these elements, um, expression, hairstyle, pose and posture, clothing. Clothing is a really important one because it tells us about a person's social status. Um, it tells us about the era in which they lived. It might tell us um, about their culture um, as well as what their occupation was. Um, setting is also key. Is the person inside or outside? Um, are they in an office? Are they in a laboratory? Are they in the Oval Office? Um, objects are also really important and it goes back to this idea of symbolism 
because those objects are there for a reason. They're there to tell us something about the individual. So the objects, by virtue of that, become symbols. Media, is it a painting, is it a sculpture, is it a photograph? Um, the size of the portrait, big or small. Um, you know, if it was commissioned, the bigger it is, the more it cost. And so by commissioned, I mean that there was a third party who paid to have a portrait created. Um, the style of the portrait, as well as what colors really stand out um, when you're taking a look at an image. So all of those things are key. So remember, as best as you can, all of these elements um, for the next thing that we're going to do. Um, so at the museum, we have come up with, over time, a number of what we call learning to look strategies. Um, what we consider ways to engage students um, in looking at a portrait. Um, and the idea is, is that you're going beyond that very simple question of what do you see. And so this first strategy that you see on the screen is called the 30 second look and just so happens to be my favorite. Um, and so in just a second, we are going to pop over to the next screen, which, go, which is going to be a portrait in the museum's collection. And I am going to give all of you 30 seconds to look at this portrait. I'm going to have you look from top to bottom, side to side, and all around. And after you've looked at the portrait for 30 seconds, we are going to take it off of the screen. Really, you're, it means you're turning away from the portrait if you were in the gallery. And then we're going to have a conversation about what you saw. But of course, you won't have the image on the screen to take a look at. So you really are going to have to pay close attention to what you see in this image. I hope everybody's ready. Your 30 seconds starts right now. Okay, um, we're going to have another poll pop up on the screen in just a second. There it is. Was Washington sitting or was he standing? Excellent, excellent. So the majority of you, 95%, um, said that he was standing. Oh, and now some people <laughs> said, <laughs> and a couple of you said that you don't remember. Um, yes, absolutely. He was standing. Excellent. So think about his pose and how he was standing. Was he holding anything in his hand or hands? And if so, what was it? Excellent. Excellent. We're having multiple responses coming back that he was holding a sword. Absolutely. And there were two pieces of furniture in this portrait. What were they? Okay, we're starting to get those responses. Absolutely. A chair and a table. And when you're looking at, when you looked at the back of the chair, at the very top there was an emblem. And so what was the emblem of and what shape was it in? A great observation um, about the uh, chair it looks like um, that it was uh, gilded so it's gold in color so we do have somebody who um, 
was paying special attention to uh, the table. Linnea uh, from Tennessee, um, she saw a pen on the table um, but didn't see one in his hand. I had noticed earlier that somebody had mentioned a pen in Washington's hand. And don't fret, everybody. We will take a look at the portrait again, and you'll be able to see, you'll be able to go back and notice what you didn't notice before and confirm the things that you did notice. Um, we have some responses. Um, Pino from DC says that uh, the shape of the emblem was oval. Um, and, oh, excellent. Um, we have um, Mina again from North Carolina said the shield uh, was red, white, and blue. Um, and then a few of you have responded about the table as well um, regarding books. And so um, there are, it looks like we're seeing five books under the table and two on the table. Um, and we've already noticed that there was a pen. What else was on the table? And as you're responding to that, um, Lori from Texas noticed an eagle. Uh, where was that eagle? Okay, so I'm seeing more responses coming in. There were papers, what looked like a cloth, perhaps a rolled up document, a scroll, um, velvet drapery. Excellent, this is a very observant group. <laughs> okay, I am seeing more and more people recognizing the um, rainbow um, in the background of the portrait, and that is an excellent, excellent observation, um, and so crucial to really the story of this painting. Um, you know, I, I tell students and teachers all the time that we could play this game, this challenge for a very long time, um, but let's not do that. Let's turn back to our portrait now so we can all take a look. And um, I want you to notice, so, oh, thank you. So we have the um, rainbow here. The emblem is right here. Um, and it's very important to note that this represents the original 13 stars and 13 stripes, the original states, the original colonies. Um, and yes, we do have two books on the table and five books under the table. Um, we also have the inkwell, the quill pen, um, the scroll, that velvet drapery. One of my favorite questions to ask for this portrait is there are two animals found in the portrait. What are they? And so some of you noted already that there are eagles. And you'll see here on the table leg that there are two eagles. But most of you might not notice on the inkwell there are dogs. The dogs are laying down and they're basically holding up the inkwell. And so one of the wonderful things about this portrait, and I think one of the reasons why it's so great to use in the classroom is that it tells such a rich story. Um, if you want to learn how to read portraiture, this is a great piece to use. If you want to learn about George Washington, this is a great piece to use. Um, if, you're if you're interested in learning about um, this particular era in history, this is a really a spectacular piece to use. Um, this portrait of George Washington is called the Lansdowne Portrait. Um, it was painted by Gilbert Stewart, who was um, a famous American artist during Washington's era. The portrait was created in 1796, um, and it is called the Lansdowne Portrait because it was commissioned by Senator and Mrs. Bingham of Pennsylvania for the Marquess or Lord Lansdowne. Lord Lansdowne was a um, great admirer of Washington's. Um, he was a supporter of the American cause. Um, and I think it's really important to note that 
this um, that this portrait went over to England in 1796 um, and remained there, um, went down through um, English families for many, many, many years until it was loaned back to the Portrait Gallery in 1968 when our museum opened to the public for the very first time. Um, and so when people think of George Washington, most think of this portrait because it really is iconic. It is meant to be um, a Washington for the ages. So the question still remains, though, what does that rainbow symbolize? If it's 1796 and the revolution is over, Washington is not wearing a military uniform, what does this rainbow symbolize? I'm seeing responses come in, hope and peace, the beginning of a new era. Certainly all of those things. Um, and when we think of rainbows, we typically think that, you know, we see them when a storm has passed. Um, and in this case, that storm was the revolution. So the idea behind the rainbow is that the storms of the revolution have passed, and it is, yes, in fact, the dawn of a new era. Absolutely, absolutely. I love all of these comments coming in. The calm after the storm, yes, absolutely. So this is Washington. If you ever have the opportunity to see this portrait in person, um, I would encourage you to get to the portrait gallery. It is eight feet tall. When it was commissioned in 1796, the commissioned price was $1,000. Seems like a steal, I think. Um, it is in pride of place in America's presidents. Um, right as you walk in, you would see it. So remember this piece. Oil painting um, on canvas, um, very much the style um, of portraiture during this era. Before we move on from it, we actually sure. have a couple other little questions here. Of course. Um, one of our participants is wondering, is that his hat, the black thing that's on the table? Yes, it absolutely is. OK. <laughs> and uh, do the dogs mean guardians for the freedom of speech? Um, I think that they can. Um, really, I think what we're seeing here is this idea of loyalty. Um, a student actually told me once that when Washington moved back to Mount Vernon, he owned something like 34 dogs. Um, so dogs were very important to him. And we think when we think of dogs, they have come to symbolize loyalty. So I think it is more along those lines. Great, thank you. Of course. OK. This, these next two portraits that we're going to take a look at, we are going to take some time and compare and contrast them. Um, and so you see Abraham Lincoln. Okay? One portrait is of Abraham Lincoln in 1860, and one is of Lincoln in 1865. Um, so we have Lincoln before he's elected, and then we have Lincoln just two months before he's assassinated. And we're going to get to the point where we're talking about how the physicality of Lincoln has changed. Um, but first, I want to talk about similarities and differences. So if you could all just chime in um, and let me know where you think those similarities and differences lie with these two portraits. And while you're chiming in, I'm just going to give you a little bit of backstory about the two pieces um, because I think that they are really so interesting. Um, this portrait on the left is of Lincoln, um, February 27th, 1860. So this is that moment um, when he gives the Cooper Union speech in New York, um, where he really becomes the candidate, um, the candidate to beat. Um, and it is Lincoln himself who says the Cooper Union speech and this particular portrait of, by, of Lincoln by Matthew Brady those are the two things that made Lincoln president um, because Lincoln was the first president to understand the importance of photography and getting his likeness out there. 
Um, and so this is really the first um, image that we see. There are certainly others, um, but this is really the one that people think back to. And then we have Lincoln in February 1865. So this is just two months before he's assassinated. You will notice that there is a crack that runs along um, this print. And the reason for that is um, really an accident during the, um, the process of creating the print. Um, it was on a glass plate negative, um, and the transition from the plate to the print, um, it cracked. And so in, in, a, in a typical process, there would be more than one print that was created. Um, but with this particular image, it was just the one. So let's see what people are saying um, about similarities and differences. Um, okay, so I'm seeing that um, we do have a difference in photo um, color, um, and that is, of course, the process in which e each of these portraits was created. Um, Maria from Illinois notes that he looks more aged and disheveled um, in the latter portrait. Certainly, certainly. Um, she has also said that the Civil War and the loss of a child has taken its toll. Um, I'm seeing that the eyes seem careworn. Um, first, he looks happier and then more serious. Um, with the uh, portrait on the left, we see more of Lincoln. Um, it's uh, what we call a three quarters. So we see his hands and we see most of his body um, and we get this idea that he's actually in a setting because there is um, a book that he's holding um, as well as a column um, in the background. But with that latter portrait, there really isn't much of anything um, to give us a sense of, um, of place, if you will. Um, somebody is noticing uh, longer hair. Um, that certainly looks to be the case. Not just longer hair, um, but facial hair, which others have mentioned as well. Um, and so when Lincoln was running for president, he didn't have a beard. Um, and it's only after he's come into office um, that he grows the beard. I see one question that popped up. Did yes. they ever determine what illness he might have had? You know what, I have heard many different stories, um, but I am honestly not sure um, if anybody can say for certain um, what it was, or if it was, in fact, anything. So you see here, of course, like I said, that the physicality of Lincoln changed. But if you're going to use these two portraits in a history classroom, um, when teaching social studies or when teaching the Civil War, uh, why does the physicality of Lincoln, why is that so important if you're teaching the Civil War? What can that tell our students um, about the war? While people are responding, um, I can answer, answer a couple of other questions. Um, there's a question about why his uh, facial expression changes from one portrait to the other. You know, my understanding um, in all of the portraits that I've seen of Lincoln, and the portrait gallery owns quite a few, um, Lincoln very rarely smiles. Um, it doesn't happen, doesn't happen so often. Um, and so with this portrait on the right, um, we see this slight smile, just ever so slight. Um, and my understanding is that he actually had a friend in the studio with him um, when this portrait was created. And at that moment when um, Alexander Gardner took this photograph, that friend made a joke. Um, and so there is that slight smile. Um, and it is interesting because again, we just, we don't ever see it. Usually we see the very serious Lincoln that we see on the left. Um, so let's get back to this idea of why the physicality of Lincoln is important if you're studying um, the Civil War and what it might tell us. 
Excellent. So um, Wynetta from Atlanta says, use the photos to teach inference and the weight of the presidency. And that's absolutely right. And, you know, the truth is, is that we use these two portraits a lot in the gallery. Um, but depending on what president you're studying, um, we always see that presidents age from the beginning of their term to the end. Um, and so it doesn't have to be with just Lincoln. It can be with really any president. Um, what an interesting activity to do maybe over a school year um, with portraits of all different um, presidents. Maybe you pick 10 um, throughout history. Um, Exactly. Uh, Shanna from Utah notes that it was a brutal war that impacted the lives of everyone, including the president, certainly. And we see it um, with that, um, with the cracked plate portrait. Um, you see the, um, the eyes and the bags under the eyes. Um, of course, you've got the facial hair, and then you've got these wrinkles and lines. Um, I think what is one of the things that's so striking about um, this particular portrait is um, the fading out as you move out from the center of the portrait, but also that Lincoln's hair is disheveled and his tie is askew. Um, because if you look at the portrait on the left, you see it's not as disheveled, but that tie is very clearly in place. Um, and so certainly a lot has happened um, in those five years. And Megan from Kansas yeah. asks something that connects directly to this. When those photos are taken, do the presidents choose what they want to look like or where they were? So was that a conscious decision for him to look like that in the second photo? Um, I think that um, it's always a conversation between the artist and the sitter, um, whether the sitter being the person in the portrait. Um, and so whether or not the sitter is the president or somebody else, I think it is always um, a conversation. For these two portraits, um, Lincoln went to the artist's studio. Um, so the setting um, was really that um, was the artist's studio. So you see, of course, that with the one on the left, we have the column um, and then the prop, the object, the book. Um, and then with the, um, with the one on the right, there isn't really a setting at all. I hope that answers your question. Um, and I just want to point out very quickly before we move on to our next portrait, um, you don't have to do this with photographs of Lincoln. Um, here you see, um, a life mask of Lincoln in 1860 and then a life mask of Lincoln in 1865. And so the idea is the same. Look at Lincoln before the Civil War and look at Lincoln at the end of the Civil War. Um, and Alairn from Arizona asked um, if he had to take pictures or was that his choice? I don't think he had to take pictures. I think that he was aware of how important it was um, to have his likeness created. Um, and so in that sense, um, he was making the choice. Um, and then Lisa from Washington asked if they were able to retouch the photos of Lincoln. So they didn't have the same uh, capabilities that we have today. But my understanding with um, this portrait on the left is that they did do certain things to make him look better. So they um, my, they moved his collar up so you saw less of his neck um, and they posed him in such a way that it actually, and maybe you all might disagree, but made him look um, more handsome than many people thought that he did. So the touch-ups have to happen before the photo is taken. Right, not like today. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, moving right along to our next portrait. So now we are in the 20th century, um, and you see on the screen um, this wonderful portrait of John F. Kennedy. And we are going to have another poll, our last poll pop up. Um, and it, the question is, what color stands out the most for you? And there's no right or wrong answer here, so feel free to let us know if, uh, if you differ from the group. Okay. 
Okay, so we're seeing a lot of green, um, which I expect because there is a lot of green and different tones of green um, in this particular portrait. And of course, the white, because where you do see the white, it is it's, it's very striking. Um, it is really as, as white as white can be. Um, and then, of course, um, black also plays a big part um, in this portrait. Um, so I want to ask all of you, how do you think color sets the tone in a portrait? We had talked about the idea of color when we were talking about the elements of portrayal. But how does color set the tone? Marie from Washington, D.C. Um, notes that color expresses mood, most certainly. It can tell you a lot about time period and the individual, their personality. Yeah, these are all great responses. Um, emotion is something um, that we certainly uh, see when we're taking a look at this portrait. And then we always have to go back to this idea of um, green, blues, and purples we think of as cool colors, and reds, yellows, and oranges we think of as warm colors. Um, and so when we think about emotion, um, when we're taking a look at this piece, um, I think that people think about it in a lot of different ways. Um, and so how do you think that the artist created this portrait? Um, are these very small, detailed brush strokes, or are they big and quick? Okay. So Oh, here's a great word. Um, Madeline from New York um, notes that there's a lot of movement in this piece. Um, and you're absolutely right. Um, and again, this idea of these long um, and quick brush strokes. This portrait of John F. Kennedy was created in 1962 um, or early 1963 um, by the artist Elaine de Kooning. Uh, Elaine de Kooning was part of an artistic movement um, during that time called Abstract Expressionism. And what Abstract Expressionism was, was exactly what you see on the screen. These, you know, long, quick, wide, um, almost frenetic uh, brush strokes. But at the same time, Elaine de Kooning was very much interested in representation. Um, and by representation, I mean actually seeing the likeness of the individual. So while we have all of these quick brush strokes and these long brush strokes, we also know for certain that John F. Kennedy is represented in this portrait. Becca from San Luis Obispo. Um, has noted that he looks uh, bored in this uh, piece, and others are saying it looks like a relaxed pose. Um, one of my favorite things about working at the portrait gallery is what I like to call the backstory of the portrait. Um, and so with this portrait, and I'll get back to this idea of this uh, relaxed or almost bored pose, um, Elaine de Kooning was commissioned by the Truman Library to paint a portrait of John F. Kennedy. And so she went to meet him in Florida in 1962, um, late 1962, and went into this sitting with him, this session, with the understanding that she was creating one portrait. Well, she realized very quickly two things about Kennedy. One, he did not like to sit still at all. And two, 
he was constantly changing his facial expressions. And so I think the neatest thing about this piece that you see in front of you is that this is just one of 23 paintings that came out of that life sitting. And so here you see Elaine de Kooning right here sketching Kennedy and here he is um, in the background and this is just one of the sketches that she created so like I said there were 23 paintings that came out of these I think seven sessions but there are hundreds of sketches that came out of those sessions and this is a wonderful wonderful representation um, of really the end product and if you look in the very back of this photograph, which by the way ran in Life magazine in 1964, you will see the portrait gallery's painting of John F. Kennedy alongside all of these other paintings that she is still working on um, in 1964. Um, Wynetta, yes, the portrait, the portraiture process is incredibly fascinating. Um, and I think that it's one of the things that's always so nice um, about looking at likenesses of individuals that we know from history textbooks. Um, you know, we read about their stories in history textbooks, but the portraits can tell us an absolutely wonderful story as well. And so with that, I think that I would like to move on to our very last um, portrait. But before we do, um, Kelly from North Carolina, she had a question that um, about Lincoln from before. Um, what are the masks made of? Um, and it is, um, it's plaster. Um, and so they are life masks. Um, and he would have actually had to have had plaster put on his face. Um, and he would have had um, straws um, either coming out of his mouth or his nose so he could breathe while the plaster dried. Um, and that 1860 um, mask that we took a look at, when that, when that plaster came off, dried, and Lincoln looked at it, he said, yep, that's the animal himself. And was that a very common practice back then or was it unusual for him to do that? Um, it was definitely a common practice, and the reason for it is those, um, those life masks would be the truest representation that you would have of an individual, and they would in turn be used to create um, statues. Um, so statues that, um, that you would see out walking about in D.C. Um, I know that the 1860 life mask that we took a look at um, was used for a statue um, that's in Springfield, Illinois now. Um, so they would have definitely been used for those sorts of things. Okay. Okay, last but not least, we have this wonderful, wonderful portrait of Barack Obama. Um, my question to all of you is, how many of you have seen this portrait before? I'm seeing a flood of yeses coming mm -hmm. into the chat here. Okay, excellent, excellent. That is what I was hoping that everybody would say. Um, and now I want you to consider where you saw this portrait and when you saw it. Okay, I'm seeing as a poster. A campaign poster, absolutely. Looks like it made it into the world of memes as well. Seeing a <laughs> Facebook meme. Yep, bumper stickers. Um, also on pins that you would wear. Um, and yes, Linda from Kansas um, notes the date, um, as does Christina, um, that we're talking about the 2008 um, presidential campaign. Um, and so this is obviously a key image. 
um, a key image that for those of us that were a part of that campaign um, and paid attention that we would have seen this particular image. But not this one that you see on the screen now. So take a close look at it. How does this particular one differ from what you saw on campaign posters and bumper stickers, um, campaign pins, t-shirts, Facebook, Okay, I, I also see a flood of responses coming in. So there is texture to this portrait and other faint images on it. Um, and yes, Maria, his name is not on this one. Instead, we see hope. Um, a lot of other times we've seen Obama. I'm getting more and more people talking about the texture and that there are these um, under images, if you will, if you will. Okay, and then this idea of mixture. Excellent. So I'm going to, I might, I'm going to move on to this next slide and I might come back to the other one in just a minute. Um, so you see on the left, we have the one that we looked at just a second ago. And then on the right, we have the one that would have been on the campaign posters and the buttons and the t-shirts. Um, and you all have said it. The difference is this idea of texture, um, of other designs, um, patterning, um, if you will, um, on the one on the left, as well as really the colors are slightly different um, between the two. And the reason for that is that the one on the left um, is what is called a fine arts version. Um, this particular portrait was created by the street artist Shepard Ferry um, in 2008. Um, and this is the first one that he created. And he knew that he had a wonderful image of Obama. And so um, he actually put... Um, or he sold, I believe, um, not many, maybe 350 uh, posters of this image in order to print um, 10,000 more. Um, and this image really became the signature image for the 2008 campaign. Um, it was not something that Ferry was commissioned to do by the Obama campaign, but he felt, Shepard Ferry did, that um, this was his way to contribute. Um, his way to campaign for the um, individual that he believed in. And so um, this portrait that we see on the right, we typically saw it as a, a small poster, um, again, on a t-shirt. Um, but the one on the left is actually probably about, I would say, maybe five feet tall by four feet wide. Um, so it's fairly large. Um, and so the great thing is, is that you'll see right here and here and even here that what Ferry has done is before he painted, before he spray painted um, this likeness of Obama, he collaged um, a whole bunch of old newspaper print, um, what really looks like either wrapping paper or a scrapbooking material, um, all onto this, um, all onto this paper. Um, I think a cardboard, and then on top of that, he put um, these various stencils that he uses in his work. And I had noticed before. Um, Darren from DC is familiar with Shepard Ferry's work because um, he mentioned the obey symbol. Um, and you see part of it right here um, in this half star. And then up here, you see a little bit more of it as well. Um, and so that is um, a symbol that Ferry puts in most of his work. And this, of course, is no exception. 
And then from there, he spray painted, again, this likeness that we see of Obama. And one of the things that strikes me um, are the colors that he used. I think it's fair to say that we can all agree that we see red, white, and blue um, in this particular portrait. But how are they positioned in the portrait? And for that, we will go back to this. So how, where do we see the blue? Where do we see the red? Um, Kelly from North Carolina is asking why Shepard Ferry uses spray paint. Um, and the reason for that is because he's a street artist. He's a graffiti artist. Um, and so that is his, um, that's, that's his, uh, you know, media of choice, if you will. Oh, Kelly from North Carolina says that it looks uh, three-dimensional, um, which I agree um, when you really look closely at this. Because while it is a two-dimensional piece, certainly um, we are seeing, um, you know, these varying layers um, on the portrait. Okay, Marina from Italy um, is noting that there is blue on the left and red on the right. And that's exactly right. Um, and so Ferry has purposely focused our, I guess, color palette um, on red, white, and blue, but particularly um, having blue be on one side and red be on the other. I see a lot of comments popping in about uh, the colors red and blue representing different ideologies as well. Do you think that played into it? Um, I do. I do think that played into it. And, you know, I think that um, I think that Ferry might have hoped that um, what people take away from this is that um, Barack Obama, with this hope at the bottom, is somebody who is going to unite um, people. Um, so I think that that was um, one of his one of his ideas behind this portrait. Um, I'm Stevie from DC asked if he used a stencil with the spray paint, and yes, yes, he did. <laughs> so we are nearing the end of um, our time together. Um, I wanted to certainly open it up to questions. Um, but I also wanted to say that, um, you know, the portrait gallery um, is open every day um, except for December 25th. Um, and if you ever make it to D.C., we have portraits of every single president um, on view. Um, and actually, that is, yes, absolutely true. Um, and the idea is, is that you get to come into this exhibition of America's presidents um, and really take a walk through history. Um, so starting with George Washington um, and going all the way to our current president. Great. And while we have this image up, we sure. actually received a student question related to this, a student yes. video question. So okay. we'll pull that up on the screen and that will start playing momentarily. Okay. Uh, just a quick little side note to our captioners. If you're able to hear me right now, please uh, also reactivate your closed captioning and we'll get that video playing momentarily. and I'm a student at Lincoln Magnet School in Springfield, Illinois. My question is, explain the importance of President Obama's mixed media portrait and why it can be considered positive propaganda. Oh, that is an excellent, excellent question. Okay, positive propaganda. Yes, usually when we think of propaganda, we do think of it as negative in a lot of ways. Um, but I think in this case, it absolutely is positive because it was used, it was created um, to be used to help elect this president. I think the most, one of the most interesting things about this particular portrait and, um, and sort of the offshoot of that with the posters and the buttons is that Shepard Ferry, he wanted the image to go viral. Um, he didn't want this image to just 
he didn't want it to just stand in a museum. And of course, we did not receive this image into our collection until after um, Obama was elected as president. And so, like I said before, initially it was 350 posters that were printed, and then the reprint was 10,000. But then on top of that, Shepard Ferry put um, a digital file of this Hope portrait on his website for people to download and do with what they pleased. And so in that sense, I do really believe that it was positive propaganda. So that's a great question. Thank you. And it looks like actually we have just reached the end of our time for this session today, but I would like to remind everyone that if we didn't get to your question along the way or you have a few that come to mind right now as we're wrapping up, please bring them to the forums on the website and over the next week we'll take a look at the comments and the questions there and hopefully provide you with some answers. Um, but I, I want to just take a moment and say thank you so much, Brianna, for covering this with us. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. Um, it was a pleasure speaking with all of you, and I hope that you all found it useful and you enjoy taking a look at the portraits that we took a look at. That's wonderful. And so we're going to be jumping off the air for just about 10 minutes as we transition to our next session. We also have a little bit more Smithsonian Folkways music for you, so I'm going to bring that up on the screen. Once again, if this is your final session and you are about to sign off for the day, we hope you'll take a quick moment to click on the evaluation button in the top left-hand corner of the screen. That will launch a survey in your web browser, and we'd love your feedback as we work on developing our future Smithsonian Online Education Conferences.